Gio has a good question. What's your top favorite mushroom and why? For me? Sure, oh, you can well, go first. I, I guess. <laughs> um, my favorite mushrooms, I have a lot of favorite mushrooms, but probably um, morels. Because mm -hmm. I prefer the taste. That's fair. And do morels have two seasons? Because like I'm just getting wind of that off Facebook. I only thought it was a, like a, a, I didn't think it starts so early. But yeah, I'm seeing a lot of morels for like springtime. Um, I'm I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, morels. They, is there like one kind of season for them, or is there like two? Yes, uh, I, there, there could be several because when we're talking about morels, we're talking about um, a number of species, right? Um, there's uh, yellow morels, black morels, and half free morels, uh, generally speaking, and each of those are several species within each of those kind of groupings. And um, I know the yellow morels will fruit differently than the black morels. But they're all pretty closely bunched together in the springtime. Cool. And if I had to pick a favorite mushroom, it would be any kind of earth star because they're really cool. <laughs> They've got like a, an outer layer that'll pop open and uh, they kind of tumble around and drop their spores everywhere. They tumble? Yeah. <laughs> Depending on the species, some of them, the like outer layer will like push up uh, so that the like fruiting body comes away from the soil and then the wind can catch it. <laughs> nice, the tumbleweed of mushroom. Kind of. <laughs> There's also a lichen called a tumbleweed lichen, but I can't remember what species it is. Um, and we have another sort of question here. It says, maybe you could talk a bit about getting started with foraging. It's a bit overwhelming with all the different mushroom varieties and figuring out timing and locations, which is something I'm still struggling with too. <laughs> yeah. Um... I, it is really hard at the beginning. I think it's a lot of fun, but um, I think it's important not to try and overwhelm yourself. Um, when you're out and if you know what you're going to pick, uh, stick to what you know with maybe expanding into two or three new species each time you're out. And when I pick new species, um, I will photograph them extensively first uh, so that I can use those photos and refer back to them later because mushrooms change after you pick them and then I separate those mushrooms those new species from the stuff that I already know so that it's not getting all smashed together and um, kind of degraded that way because it it really sucks to have all your mushrooms kind of crushed together and you realize one of them was super toxic and you're like which one exactly was the new mushroom. Um, and then I think using the Facebook groups helps a lot too, to post, uh, post your photos up of each new species and um, have people weigh in and give suggestions as to what that species might be. Yeah, I think the nice thing about the Facebook groups is that they're pretty local too. So you'll get ideas that are more relevant to Saskatchewan. Yeah. I think what helps as well is, is finding people who are local in your area. And you can use the Facebook groups for this too. And um, going out foraging with people in your area who, even if they're just for their first time, it doubles the amount of a, of a access to eyeballs that you have, right? Um, it's two people seeing are better than one. 
And I see questions about what info we should post on Facebook to get a good ID. I would say definitely different shots of the mushroom from different angles. We want to see if it has gills or pores. Mm, I guess where yeah. you found it and what kind of plants it was growing with is always good. The photos that I would recommend, um, it's actually quite a few. Uh, the first one that you need, and uh, this is probably the most important, is one in situ, so one that's still before the mushroom has been picked. And kind of a medium shot, sort of downward angle from the side. You want all of your photos to be in natural lighting. You don't want to take them inside and get those sepia tones blurring out uh, certain colors. Um, so you want one in that manner. And then you're going to have to pick the mushroom. When you pick the mushroom, make sure you include the very base of the stem and photograph it from the side. And in this photo, try to get a size reference in there as well. So we can tell how big the photo is, even if that's just your hand or a pocket knife or something. I carry a clear ruler with me. Um, it makes a good size reference. So I that people looking at it can tell if it's a few centimeters or, you know, eight inches. Um, and then you want to photograph uh, the area that produces spores. So in most mushrooms, that would be under the cap, looking at the gills or the pores. And this needs to be in focus as well. You see a lot of these uh, photographs coming out that are kind of blurred, and then it's really hard to see um, very minute details that can be telling of the mushroom that you have. And then you, you just want to photograph close up features that just look startling to you, like a ring is one of them. If there's any sort of cup around the base, that's another. Um, any sort of strange markings that you see on the cap. Or if you see multiple species and some are older than others, comparison shots like that are very nice as well. That was kind of long-winded, but uh... <laughs> yeah, all good information, though. Yeah, I like if yeah. you can find if you find them in a clump when you have really young ones, kind of mid-range and old ones, so you can see how they mature. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's also really important to photograph where the stem is coming from. If the stem is attached to wood, that's really important to know. And if you can figure out what kind of wood or what tree that that's growing from, or if the earth is next to a tree, if it's growing from the earth, then that's really important as well. Mm -hmm. um. What else do we have here? Oh, I see Geo says that iNaturalist app can help a lot in field. Um, yeah, sometimes you can get decent identifications from just taking a photo and seeing what the algorithm says it might be. I would be careful with it. Sometimes it, I don't know, will pick up irrelevant features and give you the wrong species, but it can definitely narrow down as to where you want to look. Yeah, it can narrow down your own research. I would never base my decision to eat something on an app. Um, I have had, uh, I tried using an app once and I'm not even making this up. This is a true story. And uh, I put in a photo I had of Gallerina Marginata and uh, I can't remember what it came up with, but it came up with something completely different uh, that looked similar. I think it was a honey mushroom that it said it was, which of course is edible. Gallerina marginata is the funeral bell. So you want to not make that mistake, right? They're a very close lookalike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm usually like, I'm always pretty wary about eating things that I've never found before either. So cross-referencing multiple field guides is always good too, if you can do that. Have you ever been poisoned, JC? Not that I know of. <laughs> yeah. 
How about you? Yeah, once um, when I was first kind of starting out, I I, uh, I ended up poisoning me and my wife with mm-hmm. uh, nothing nothing overly serious. It was foliota. Um, scaly cap mushrooms so they're moderately poisonous or mild um it was about maybe 36 hours of burping vomiting and diarrhea all at once and uh we were at the cabin so there was only one toilet (laughs) and there was two of us so it was pretty pretty creative that sounds like a bad time yeah, it was a pretty bad time. But they didn't taste that bad. That's one one I, I think is kind of a myth out there that uh, poisonous mushrooms will taste bad. Some of the best tasting mushrooms are some of the most toxic. <laughs> That's not good. Like which ones? Uh, supposedly the death cap tastes quite good. Noted, noted. <laughs> yeah. Um, the one I mentioned, um, the funeral bell, uh, also it has the same toxins as the death cap, but this is a much smaller mushroom and it grows in clumps and it looks a lot like enoki or a honey mushroom. Uh, these are supposed to taste quite good. I've never, I've never tried tasting one. Um, there's no harm in tasting and spitting even these most toxic mushrooms. So maybe I'll try it next time I find, find one of those. Brave. Yeah. Well, I, mushrooms have to be ingested to poison you. So yeah. you put it in your mouth and roll it around a little bit and then spit it out. You're, you're fine. Um, the mushroom I poisoned myself on uh, smells heavily of garlic. And it actually tasted pretty good, too. That'd be hard to resist, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see another question on here. It says, can you talk about the species-specific sim- symbiotic relationships between the trees and shrubs and their fungi? I know that aspens are helped by chanterelles and amanitas. Do you know of others for aspen, green ash, birch? Uh, my interest stem, oh, my interest in terms of restoration, but this would help the foragers as well as where to look. Yeah, uh, aspen has a lot. I mean, the biggest one that I can think of is the aspen bullet or the bullet. Uh, several of the lacinum species, um, in particular the aspen bullet uh, grows specifically with aspen or in combination with aspen and birch. Um, JC, do you know of others that grow with aspen? Mm, Trying to think. You know, there's a whole lot of mushrooms that just simply grow with cottonwoods, right? Mm-hmm. So they'll grow with aspen, cottonwoods, or, or poplar. Um, they tend to have Latin names that end with populinum or populicola. Wouldn't oyster mushrooms fit in that category? Yes, they would. Um, the oyster mushroom that we have here growing prolifically um, a lot of people will say it is uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the genus name for it. Oh uh, um, Pleurotus. Yeah, Pleurotus. They they'll say it's Pleurotus austriatus. But what people don't realize is that Pleurotus austriatus is kind of like a, a type name for a whole bunch of species that look identical to Pleurotus austriatus. And the one we have here, I think, is probably Pleurotus uh, populinum that grows almost specifically on poplar and aspen. But that's not really a symbi. It's not really growing um, 
it's a saprobic species and a parasitic species, right? So I wouldn't say it's really helping the trees. <laughs> what about morels that grow near poplar trees? Are they connected at all or just happen to be together? Morels, I don't think are understood very well. Um, some people believe they are both mycorrhizal and saprobic at various times in their life. Um, depending on the, the stage that the forest is in, right? Like a lot of morels will grow um, much quicker after a forest fire. And they're certainly not mycorrhizal at that point in time, but uh, they, they've shown to be mycorrhizal and kind of in sort of a symbiotic relationship while the stage is, while the forest is younger. And they generally grow on different hardwoods, right? Or you find them in mixed wood forest. Morels? Yeah. Uh, no, some of them can grow with conifers and pine. Hmm. Um, Probably it depends on the species. species. Yeah, I, I would be really interested to know what species actually occur in Saskatchewan. Um, when we say a black morel, we're talking about like a dozen, a dozen or more species that all look pretty much identical. And you would need to go to genetic testing to figure it out. I don't know if anyone here is a student at the University of Saskatchewan, but we're looking at doing a project in the fall that involves ITS sequencing on some old mushroom specimens we've got in the museum. So just a heads up. Oh, <laughs> that would be cool. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what we'll get, but... <laughs> What does ITS stand for? Oh, I should know this because I've taught it before. <laughs> it's a certain part of the DNA sequence. So it might be like something, hmm, I can look it up. Oh, internal transcribed spacer. That sounds right, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. <laughs> I think it would be really cool if you did the morel species and the hedgehog species. Because mm -hmm. those are two groups that um, there's, there's a lot of missing info in Saskatchewan as to what species is occurring here. Yeah, and the morels, it's fairly recently that like genetic sequencing has split them up so much, right? Into so many different species. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I saw uh, a, qu uh, a comment there about picking morels in old spruce forest. And I just wanted to kind of point to that comment and see um, where I found morels has been an old jack pine forest. So that just shows some diversity right there. Those could be two completely different species that you're looking at. And then I've found yellow ones in um, oak forest in Manitoba. <laughs> yeah. I found yellow morels um, in a backyard with nothing else growing there at Emma Lake. Oh, no way. Yeah, so no idea. <laughs> it's probably some root of something random. I think the um, weirdest were... place I've found it is in a neighbor's yard in Saskatoon here. In their grass clippings, other, under like some Cotone aster shrubs. And I mm. honestly don't know how it ended up there. <laughs> Yep. I've found them in dense aspen forest too, with just like aspen around, aspen and poplar. Yeah, it makes me wonder if they're generalists or if there's just a ton of different species specific. I think it's it's the, the quite a few species. This was kind of been the decision, and I don't think they're all done sequencing them out either, right? Especially since there's large like plots of, I don't know, the earth where nobody's doing any sequencing at all, like Saskatchewan in the West here, mm -hmm. right? I don't think anybody's sequenced anything past the Rocky Mountains yet. Not really. Uh, I see a question from Eric about where one could send mushroom samples to be sequenced. There used to be the North American Mycoflora Project, but I 
believe they may have stopped doing that. I'll definitely have to look into it though. Um, you can do your own sequencing and send it off, but it requires a lot of very expensive reagents. And I think last I checked a set of little tubes to send off for sequencing were about $400, I think. <laughs> That was pre-COVID. Yeah. It might be more now. <laughs> Plus, you kind of need to know what you're looking at once it's sequenced, right? Mm. So and um, cost and uh, project for the university for your project. Sorry, I say with a four hundred dollar price tag and special specialization, sounds like a good project to go with your sequencing idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so generally, if we do that at the university, it'll be just like one tube per student. <laughs> Ideally, if we were going to do it with research, we'd send away multiple replicates, I guess. So it could be pretty costly. Yeah. And that's kind of the barrier of figuring out what actually occurs here, right? Because mm -hmm. we can say, e even if you do one black morel, you say, well, that species occurs here, but how many others, right? You'd have to sequence quite a few of them to get any sort of idea. Yeah, it would be really nice, I don't know, to be able to eventually one day <laughs> fund a project and get someone who knows genetics on board and that kind of thing at pretty large scale. Yeah. Um, we have a question. Does anyone use reagents for mushroom ID in the field? I have read about it, but never taken any out myself. Um, I want to, I would like to start doing that this year. Uh, I think we were talking JC at one point about where to buy these reagents. And you said that you could possibly buy them through the university. Yeah, they might be available in the Fisher catalog or that kind of thing. So what I'm really hoping is that we'll offer a mycology class again someday so I can have an excuse to have some in the lab, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would like to get a hold of some of them specifically for looking at Rosella species mm -hmm. because uh, IDing Rosella's and there's a lot of Rosellas in Saskatchewan it is very much dependent upon uh, reactions to those agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to do some more snooping and see what, <laughs> I don't know if it's available for like use outside of the university. Oh. oh, another question here. Which time of year or seasonal conditions are best for finding morels? Which is a good question because there's all kinds of fun memes flying around the internet about this right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say the wetter our spring is going to be, probably the better it will be. Um, it wasn't the best year last year, but it also was a pretty dry, dry spring, even at that point in time, certainly where I was. Um, there is a way to do this for real, and that is you get a, a soil thermometer and you measure the temperature of the soil. Hmm. And um, I don't remember exactly what it was supposed to be. You could, you could probably look it up online, the temperature that it needs to exceed for morels to start growing. And that's how I think uh, professionals go about determining when, when to start. They'll have their place already and they just measure the soil temperature to know when to go. Oh, and I see Eric says that Sigma Aldrich sells to private folks. That's good to know, actually, because I've, I've looked at like 
Fisher reagents selling to private before and they jack up the price a lot if you're not with an institution, but I'll have to look into Sigma Aldrich. Oh, and I see a question. Can sodium hydroxide solution be used instead of potassium hydroxide for testing certain agaricus species? No idea. I've never heard of using it instead. I'm not sure what it is that actually reacts with the, the mushroom, like if the uh, potassium's important or not. Yeah, I would exactly. Guess that it probably is. Uh, just based on, I'm thinking of like, I don't know, iodine, potassium, iodide, testing for starch and that kind of thing, that maybe the potassium is important. But yeah, I can't really give a good answer for that one. Would it make it easier to obtain? Hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, Eric says that a kilo of potassium hydroxide is 60, 66.50 on Sigma Aldrich. Eric, do you know if that's in solid form or powdered or pellets? Hmm. 90% purity flake. That would be easy to mix up then. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he's dropped a link in here. Thanks for checking that out. Yeah, I think another thing that I want to uh, start doing this year is uh, I want to buy a microscope and start looking at spores to ID some of these kind of species where it's it's likely to be several species that all look the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be nice. Could even get a... I don't know. I wonder if we could start a little like repository of photographs of uh, the spores from different species. That might be fun. Yeah. It would be nice to have just a full on set of photographs for a species that we say that we find through the group as well as the spores alongside it. Mm -hmm. Because then we would really have have the ability to actually start some sort of microbank. It's an excellent idea. <laughs> no, I thought I saw at one point, um, a microscope that you could plug into your phone and see kind of on the phone what you were looking at. They Does work, that actually exist? They work for the trichomes on cannabis. I'm not sure if they'd be good enough for the spores or not. They, they work for the trichomes. Hmm. Hmm. Like the magnification might not be high enough, hey? Yeah, I know it's worth it's worth a shot. If I get a hold of some spores, I can definitely let you guys know how that goes. Well, thanks. That would be awesome. Yeah. I know that I've seen some spores that are like small enough. You need an oil immersion lens, which can get pretty, pretty pricey for a microscope. But Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking, but we'll, we'll give her a go. <laughs> yeah, me as well. Let's grab a portabella from the store and <laughs> that's the thanks for that because like i probably would have been like looking around at some of my old specimens to like see if they left any behind <laughs> that's a good idea 
Well, the portobellos are are mature, right? So they should be able to give off spores at room temperature there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even some of like the little mushrooms, if you're looking for something cheaper, when they start to get a little bit old in the store and open up, I've gotten some good yep. spore prints from those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And agaricus love their spores. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, someone says, I've been trying to find a Noki for the last few years with no luck. Can you shed any light on when and where to be looking? What city are you in? So I can tell you exactly where to find it in Saskatoon. <laughs> Oh, Esther Hazy area. I have no idea. Um, just dead elm, dead <laughs> elm trees, stumps. The closer the stump is to the ground, I think is probably the better. Um, you want to look as well, shady places, right? Not directly out in the sun necessarily. And then we have another person from Saskatoon and someone from near Yorkton. If you have any tips on either of those places. If you're in Saskatoon, go to Ruth and Cumberland. And there is, I think it's Cumberland. Anyways, there's a fence there. Along the fence is about nine stumps. Uh, I think they were poplar. Uh, they're full of anoki. <laughs> That's where I go every year. I found better luck in the very late fall. But um, in the fall, you could pick a good three or four pounds of it uh, every three or four days or so. Right. Wow. So there should be some on there now. I can go check right after the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think of what's... It's, uh, it's an intersection with a stop sign. I'm pretty sure it's Ruth and Cumberland. Yeah, I think the next one down with a stop sign is Broadway and Ruth. So. Right. Well, there would be Clarence um, down with a, the street lights, yeah. And then after that would be Broadway. So yeah, that's... That's Ruth and Cumberland. Oh, awesome. And it, they're hidden in the grass. It's, uh, last couple of years I've been there, the grass is very tall, overgrowing, and overgrowing these stumps quite a bit. So that's what's providing the shade. Um, so that's that's a spot, the Noki. And then I know of a couple other places in the area where it's just stumps on people's lawns, but then you got to kind of like lawn sprint, right? Sprint over there, grab it and sprint back. <laughs> or just ask permission. You could do yeah. that. <laughs> I was going to say, you're not like me who goes to the neighbors and is like, excuse me, can I uh, harvest your mushrooms? <laughs> um. Oh, Geo says any toxic lookalikes for Anoki. Hmm. Yes. Good question. Um, uh, the funeral bell Gallerina marginata is another mushroom. It's a spring mushroom, but it shouldn't be growing this early. Uh, remember, we saw it on that um, group walk, JC, that was at Emma Lake and uh what was the other one anglin oh, last year what what time of year was that oh, when was that i think that was june or probably July. yeah so it is still kind of in the early summer spring time um but that's a very toxic one the other one uh that grows in cool weather is uh that we haven't talked about is the sulfur tuft, uh, Hypoloma fasciculari. And that one is, is a nasty little mushroom too. Mm 
and it has killed some people. Um, but that one supposedly tastes really terrible. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, and what are the hallmarks of enoki? What should we be looking for when picking them? Uh, densely bunched together. Um, so much so that you're going to get overlap of the caps. And what you'll notice when you pick like a clump of enoki, oftentimes uh, it looks like there's almost a white mold on it. That is not mold, that is heavy spore deposit. And that meant that there were larger caps over top of it that are now gone. Um, so look for that spore deposit on the caps that are crammed up underneath larger caps. Uh, you want to see in the stem, you want to see it becoming quite dark or even with a greenish tint near the base of the stem where it connects to the wood. Um, it should smell pretty good. And then the, uh, the gills, if they're young, will be kind of white and it, as it ages, kind of become kind of like a, an off-white, beige-ish sort of color. And I see John wants to know if we can send him some to clone. <laughs> if I find some, I totally could. Some what? <laughs> oh, some uh, Enoki. Oh. <laughs> um. I have some dried enoki in a jar. Um, I use it for soups. Yeah, I can even show you. The lookalikes that uh, are you want, don't want to eat, do they also grow on the tree stump? Yes, they do. So here is my mushrooms, still dried from last year, not done. And then there's couple of canaries sitting on them too. <laughs> yeah, um, the mushrooms that would be most commonly mistaken for those will be the funeral bell and the sulfur tuft, and they also grow on wood. And they're also in Saskatchewan. Do the sulfur tufts glow under black light? I don't know, not, not that I've ever heard of, um, but maybe they do. <laughs> have you ever heard of that, Jason? I haven't. I, I have heard of what, some what? mushrooms growing under black light, but I yeah. honestly can't remember which ones right now. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I think certain mushrooms look very different under black light. I've just never really experimented with that. So I don't know which ones would be more, more uh, prominent. A quick Google search says yes, but I can, I can encourage everyone to, to take a quick look themselves if they're interested. Hmm. That's what about cool. Enoki? I, I, that's a, it doesn't jump to mine, but I'll do a quick search. <laughs> Because maybe that's a way to tell them apart. One thing to remember too is that Enoki looks very different in the store than it does in the wild. Mm -hmm. Because what you're seeing in the store is actually growing in pitch darkness underground. And without exposure to the sun, um, the caps don't grow out and they, they don't gain that kind of dark orangish um, color, that vibrant color that they have. There's some pretty amazing videos I have found on YouTube, actually, of, um, I guess, Anoki farms in Japan. And it's really cool how they'll use leftover stuff from milling rice and put it in jars and grow the enoki in there so they grow like nice and tall and upright. Hmm. That's Pretty cool. Fascinating.
No dings for Anoki glowing, but again, only a quick search. <laughs> um, oh, and do the toxic species grow in dense clusters like Anoki does? Sulfur tuft definitely does. Sulfur tuft um, looks an awful lot like a honey mushroom, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, and they're in very dense, dense groupings. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll cover like a whole spot, kind of like honey mushrooms do as well, not just a single tree, but uh, a system or grouping of trees. Uh, there's a spot in Saskatoon in one of the parks where there's this kind of bushy area and you go in there and uh, two years ago, there was thousands and thousands of sulfur tufts in there. Uh -huh. It's growing from the roots and from from the base of the stumps and from trees that were still alive, actually. Oh, and then, oh, John says, store Anoki get the long stem from growing in high CO2 environment. I could see that. Yep, that, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, and someone's asked here, can you talk about seeding with wild mushroom spore in natural habitat, not using bags or logs? What works well, how long to fruit, etc. Or are you better off not bothering? Um, I mean, I, I don't see why not. Uh, I know some people will make like a, a slurry where they just basically dump some some mushrooms in a I imagine a blender or something. I mean, kind of like a liquid culture that they can pour onto dead logs that way. I've been planning a little mushroom bed in my yard. I don't know if it's going to work out, but I was thinking of doing something kind of like that. Maybe just with oysters or something easy to grow. Mm -hmm. And I can get back to you in a couple of years and let you know <laughs> if it's fruiting. I mean, you can do oysters just in wood chips, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know a guy in the city who sells, like, great big bags of aspen sawdust that I thought I might kind of, I don't know, mix up with some straw or something. Inoculate a stump? Could do that. You know what I've done? Um, and maybe this isn't something I should, like, just tell everybody I do, but it, it's been enjoyable is that sometimes when I find a large fruiting near my cabin of oysters I just go and get a tree saw and I cut out the section of the wood where the oyster is growing and then I stick it behind the shed right <laughs> I've got about like eight or nine stumps there and um, they produce oysters every year right there in the shade there they're still in the forest but then I don't have to walk through the woods to find them so I feel like that's not too bad. You're not moving it that far from its natural environment. You're still in the same, you know. Yeah, well, I got a carry it, area. Right? So, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> not shipping it to another province or anything. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and Dustin says they've inoculated ten logs with plug spawn about two weeks ago. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, interesting. Did you do the whole candle wax thing? wax it in there i inoculated um uh, uh a log as well in my parents house with a comb tooth mushroom so mm. see if that ever fruits <laughs> oh yeah dustin did the wax and Dwight says they found 36 pounds of oysters last year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and oh, John says oysters will grow well outdoors and blues grow the best. Unless you're doing logs, he'd suggest cloning a local oyster. Yeah. Yeah, if I could find local ones, that would be ideal. I've grown the blues indoors before. They're kind of fun. I just like the color, but yeah, for outside, I bet. Something growing nearby would probably have the most success anyway. 
What kind of up around where you're, you, you, you have a cabin up at Anglin Lake, don't you, Jason? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know that little highway that you had to go to to get to where we were um, leading that group? Mm, the bridge there, yeah. The, the bridge? That highway was so densely clustered with oysters last year, I, I would just stop my car every minute or so and just grab a, a pump of them. Oh, no way. Uh, I had a, I had like the day before, because I went there the day before to kind of check it out. And I ended up with like 10, 15 pounds of oyster mushrooms just driving through that area. So if oh. you want local species, maybe that's where you should look. That's a great idea. I'll have to pay more attention to that this year. Because I do occasionally hike up that way. It wouldn't take much to just pop over and check out the trees. <laughs> What exactly do you mean when you say clone? Hmm. So mushrooms are really cool in that they can kind of regrow from any part of the mycelium or the tissue. Uh, so basically by, I don't know, babying a little piece of mushroom or planting a planting a piece of it in the right substrate, you can clone the original one and it'll just keep growing. Yeah, she's talking about the, um, I've got no words right now. Oh, that's okay. Not the mushroom necessarily itself, but mm -hmm. the, uh, the fungus beneath. Yeah. Yeah, the mycelium. Uh, if you take a piece of the mycelium, it will continue to grow independently of the original mycelium kind of grouping. So that would be a clone, I, I believe. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, really cool in the lab because we can get a whole bunch of fungus on a plate and just isolate the tiniest little bit of any of it and then basically clone it on a new plate. So, it's... so a piece grown from a piece instead of coming from a new spore. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> It's like when you take a cutting of a plant, I guess. Oh, and I see one of the best for outdoor growing is wine cap, says John. I have never had wine cap mushrooms. Yeah, they're quite good. Um, if I was going to be growing mushrooms this year outdoors, that's the one I would be doing. Stropharia rugosa annulata, I believe. Mm -hmm. And well, John recommends taking a tissue culture and put it on an agar dish, and then the mycelium will grow from the tissue culture. That's also a really good description of it. <laughs> and Dwight says if you get a pile of oysters or any gilled mushroom, I suggest using an air mattress inflator to blow the bugs out. That's an awesome idea, actually. I've never thought of blowing them out. That's a good idea. Yeah. I usually tap the top of the mushroom to kind of try and knock them out, but I'm kind of a glutton. I don't even often care if there's bugs in it. I'll just <laughs> eat it anyways. Yeah, especially if you're cooking it anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It all just becomes a part of the sauce. <laughs> Oh, and John's got several bags of wine cap ready to go in the garden. That's exciting. Maybe I will try that this year. Be fun. <laughs> and then a lot of people saying the bugs will add extra protein. <laughs> yeah. And strangely enough, insects and Insect exoskeletons and mycelium cell walls are both made out of chitin. So they fit right in. Mm -hmm.
Any more questions from anybody? <laughs> Well, it looks like that might be it. Oh, does Resula emetica grow in Saskatchewan? Yep, but Resula emetica is not what people think it is. Um, first off, it, it, it refers to a number of species, one of which is Resula emetica. But when people are finding Resula emetica, mostly they're finding Rosella uh, cremori color, oh. or um, there's a couple others as well. These are also called emetic rosellas or the sickener. Um, none of them are very toxic. They're not what people make them out to be in old books. They're now known to be completely edible if cooked properly or pickled. Um, and people do eat these throughout the world. Rosella emetica itself grows in sphagnum moss. So if you're picking a red Rosella and it's not like in a sphagnum swamp, then you're not looking at Rosella emetica. But uh, a lookalike that is probably just as spicy, but, uh, but not as toxic as people would have you believe. In fact, I pick Rosella emetica and eat them. <laughs> a couple more questions here. Does anyone know okay. of people doing tours or walks in the Yorkton area? Nope, no idea. I'm not sure. You should do one, whoever answered that question or asked <laughs> that question. <laughs> John. Yeah, you have good information on mushrooms. If you host a, a tour, I'd definitely come down that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could make an outing to the Yorkton area. <laughs> I haven't been down there for years, so I wouldn't know where to go. But yeah, Me neither. Really cool. It's just the name. <laughs> Oh, a large patch of shaggy parasol grows in John's window every year. That's really cool. How lucky you are. That's, <laughs> that's a really excellent mushroom. Those are really cool looking ones too, eh? <laughs> yeah, and you know, I've, I've been wondering whether or not they look like uh, the closely related chlorophyll chlorophyllum molybdites uh, that everybody's so afraid of, the vomiter whether it actually even occurs in Saskatchewan. And yeah. I don't think so. I think we're too far north. So I've never seen it. And I've seen an awful lot of shaggy parasols, but I've never seen parophyllum lipides mm -hmm. for sure that I know of. Um, oh, what did I miss here? Oh, I thought that there was one, is it a Russula maybe, that was really spicy that yep. someone was interested in? Yep. That's, that would be, um, again, Russula emetica is extremely spicy. Okay. Um, Russula cremora color is extremely spicy. So uh, the are. copper Russula. Yeah, well, there's uh, probably a dozen or more really spicy Russula species in Saskatchewan. Um, as well as milk caps, like my favorite milk cap, cap is uh, Lactarius rufus, which is the red hot milk cap. Mm. And it is like, uh, you, you do need to cook these mushrooms. They are toxic raw. Um, but once prepared or cooked, uh, they're not toxic anymore. And the, uh, the toxicity is more of an exaggeration of the Western palate because these mushrooms are eaten as a delicacy in places like Turkey. And um, some of them are made into spices in India and places like that, where, you know, people are more accustomed to 
either like stringent or bitter or or like cayenne pepper level spice. When I was first learning to identify mushrooms, I was out in Alberta and I was just having a heck of a time with one of them and I'd narrowed it down to some kind of lactarius and someone came by and said, hey, did you taste that one yet? And I didn't know the red hot lactarius was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I spit that out pretty fast. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it, the spice really lasts in your mouth mm -hmm. like for a long time, too. Like, it really sticks in there. But, uh, I like spicy food, so I do cook them in, like, a curry mm -hmm. as a base, and I, I quite like them. Well, that's a good idea. Yep. And, oh, there's a question here. Um Oh, differences between sulfur tuft and honey mushroom. Any really striking differences? Yeah, um, sulfur tuft uh, supposedly tastes pretty awful. Um, trying to think of what they smell like. I don't quite remember. You'd have to look like look that up. Once you hold one in your hand, um, you you'll notice the difference right away. It's just when you haven't really seen the two before, um, it's it's hard to tell. It can be hard to tell. Mm. And one of those, like, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, could you go ahead. One of those where you kind of need to see them side by side once to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Honey mushrooms, in all honesty, the funeral bell really doesn't look that much like a honey mushroom. Um, sulfur tufts, I, I think, look quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. oh, going down the comments here oh john might take us up on doing a tour that would be fabulous <laughs> um uh, and has never seen the vomiter in saskatchewan and beverly ann says many ukrainian people in the yorkton area have secret locations and they use the ukrainian names for the mushrooms um also in the fish creek area Good to know. We'll have to hook up with some Ukrainians then. Mm -hmm. Get them to show <laughs> us, show us where. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And it says, I believe the honey mushroom is pronounced, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Pidpanky in Ukrainian. Yeah. Something like that. Cool. Yeah, I have jars and jars of that too, still from last year. Mm. So. <laughs> yeah, it's funny when I've talked to people who have grown up picking a certain type of mushroom on their farm or something. And they can't quite describe it, and they'll have some funny common name for it. And I'm always really curious what it actually is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I remember spending a lot of time, I think two years ago, trying to figure out what this one, um, what this mushroom this one woman was picking in Saskatoon. Uh, it was a tricholoma species. Tricholoma populinum is what it turned out to be, um, which is called poplar mushroom. Uh, but it, her mom had been picking it. That it, it had been generations that they'd been picking it in this spot. And uh, they just called it the Italian name for mushroom. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what they knew it as. They didn't actually know what it was, but they'd been eating it for years. <laughs> Uh, geo honey mushroom mycelium um, can be faintly phosphorescent. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to try to grow the honey mushroom indoors. So 
says John. That is something I have never tried. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of mushrooms that are uh, that are saprobic that I'm surprised people aren't growing, like bluets, like the wood bluet. I, I never really hear of anybody growing the wood bluet indoors. Hmm. Um, honey mushrooms, I think, because their life cycle often starts off as parasitic might be a little bit more difficult. I don't know. Oh. I have to try it. So you might need living wood to start? Yeah. I mean, honey mushrooms transition into sap saprobes once they, uh, once they kill the host. Mm. But um, I wonder if they would go directly to being sap saprobic. Mm -hmm. They, they might if you study. clone. Yeah. If you, if you maybe clone some mycelium that was be acting as saprobic, then maybe that would be more successful. That makes sense. 